Hey there everyone and welcome to our webinar. We are going to discuss the topic that is being heavily covered in the news these days, the opioid epidemic and how employers and employees can protect themselves from the opioid epidemic. I am Luke Kibbe. I'm going to be your moderator today. But before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we've done a, quite a few of these webinars now, and if there's anything you'd like uh, for us to cover, you can email us uh, through our website, uh, sales at clinfleet.org. Uh, let us know if there's a subject you'd like us to cover, and, uh, and we can plan, it in, plan to do that in the next uh, couple of months. Also, this webinar is interactive and your phones will be muted, so please submit your questions in the chat box. I'll keep an eye on them and we'll have a Q&A session at the end to answer them. And lastly, you will receive the presentation and link of the recording after the webinar, so keep an eye on that in your email tomorrow. Before we begin, let's cover uh, what we're going to be covering today. There's going to be a quick introduction to the opioid epidemic. What exactly is the culprit? Is it really an epidemic? What is the government doing about it? The cause and substance abuse in the workplace, and of course, what companies can do to protect themselves. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm excited to introduce Clean Fleet's drug testing industry expert and account manager, Lucas Shaw, with his help. CleanFleet manages hundreds of drug testing programs and consortium needs nationwide. So go ahead, uh, Lucas, welcome, and take it away. Thanks a lot, Lucas. Again, my name is Lucas Shaw, and I'm the account manager here for CleanFleet. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to be going over uh, the opioid epidemic. Um, it is certainly present, uh, ever present in our society currently, and it's definitely important to get some facts out there and uh, for employers to start looking for solutions to help people. Um, so just kind of an idea, uh, in 2014 and 2015, uh, we saw uh, a major increase in the deaths uh, attributed to opioid overdose. Uh, 28,000 in 2014 and over 33,000 in 2015. Um, we are definitely anticipating that this number continues to rise um, as the epidemic continues to get worse and worse. Um, so what specific drugs are we referring to when we're talking about opioids? Um, for a large part, we're talking about prescription drugs. Um, the, a lot of these in 2014 were a result of drug poisonings, 61% um, were related to opioid or heroin. Um, this is partially related to a cultural shift in the way that doctors were addressing pain. Um, the uh, change um, really began in the mid-80s. Um, it became more of a push to address pain directly um, and not basically teach people to live with it and get over it. So there have been a, a massive amount of prescription painkillers, opiates that are prescribed. Uh, oftentimes many people are over-prescribed. Um, about 2 million people meet the criteria uh, for prescription painkiller use disorders. Um, and about roughly just over 4 million use these types of medications without medical authorization, purchasing them on the black market. Um, and uh, in 2015, a 2015 study found that 2 million adults had a substance use disorder involving prescription opioids. So this is a major part that oftentimes is overlooked. Uh, people talk about heroin and fentanyl, which we'll get to. But prescription drugs are really the main culprit, and in this case, oftentimes are the gateway. Um, heroin uh, is it's, it's the street opiate. Um, oftentimes, people that are use uh, prescription drugs for pain and then become addicted after doctors will no longer prescribe them because they said they don't need them. 
people will move on to heroin. It's cheaper than a lot of um, uh, pharmaceutical uh, opiates, um, and we have seen a major increases in the number of overdoses, tripling between 2010 and 2014. Um, and definitely the regions hit hardest are in the Northeast and the Midwest. Uh, fentanyl is one that you've definitely heard most recently in the news. Um, there was a child in Miami that overdosed on fentanyl um, through incidental contact. Uh, fentanyl is incredibly uh, powerful and also highly addictive. Um, it, what people are usually running into on the street is uh, manufactured in foreign countries. Um, it's not the pharmaceutical fentanyl that comes from prescription drug companies. Um, and it's oftentimes fentanyl is mixed in with other drugs um, or used um, as a uh, used as a cover for a, for basically counterfeit prescription drugs. Um, it is highly, highly potent. I don't think I can stress that enough. There was an incident about two months ago where a New York police officer just touched it, and that was enough exposure that his, his body basically went into shock. Um, there's a, there's a great quote down here from Acting Administrator Rosenberg um, uh, discussing uh, opioids. Um, basically, it's it, I think it's very clear that this is a public health crisis of historic proportions. I certainly think that's an accurate statement. So um, are we really dealing with an epidemic? Uh, yes. <laughs> there are a couple of indicators. Um, one, uh, there are just so many people dying that they really don't have places to store them. Um, the, in, in Ohio, they've had to use, uh, re, go and use cold storage trailers as morgues. Um, you can see the opioid-related deaths increased by 700% in a 13-year span. That is horrifying. Um, there's also been uh, a lot, uh, a certain increase in the pilots being affected, um, testing positive. Um, uh, example uh, in, of this year of a pilot and his wife overdosing um, in their home. Um, luckily, this the FAA is under the Department of Transportation, so they are they do have certain drug and alcohol testing regulations, um, but the. I mean, like this type of drug is affecting some of the highest and some of the people that are in the highest safety sensitive positions out there in the American industry. And uh, you're also seeing it in the armed forces. Um, uh, several uh, Navy SEALs were removed uh, for their illicit drug use. Um, uh, and. I mean, this was only caught because the SEALs have a random drug testing. Um, but there are some in the military that aren't held to that standard. And when you're deployed, oftentimes, there's no opportunity for that test to happen. Um, I'm certain you've heard recently the discussions about what the government is doing about this. Um, recently in the healthcare debate with Medicaid and with the uh, Better Care Reconciliation Act, um, there have been discussions uh, about the opioid epidemic and what currently can be done about it. Um, I believe this was in the previous administration awarded about four hundred and eighty five million to states to combat combat the opi opioid epidemic. Um, just some examples. Oregon can receive around six million, Washington around eleven million, and California around forty four. Um, it's awarded based on rates of overdose deaths um, and uh, 
Vermont, uh, with one of the strictest drug testing laws, is still receiving about two million. So this, I mean, it's it's very very serious. Um, uh, the Department of Transportation also wants to increase the number of opioids that are uh, searched for in a DOT drug screen, adding about four more uh, hydrocodone, hydromorphine, oxycodone, and oximorphine um, to the drug uh, driver testing panel, um, as they're generally taken as pain pills and often abused. Um, this is supposed to take effect and. October of 2017, um, and they're assuming, based on HHS uh, numbers, that this will increase the number of positives by about 1%, which could lead to the FMCSA going back to its testing rates of about two years ago at 50%. Um, for employers, it's really uh, critical to see the cost of this, um, looking at what is lost by having an employee that is uh, abusing drugs, specifically opioids. Um, there's major amounts of lost time, you know, of retraining and uh, job turnover, uh, health care costs. I mean, you're looking at around de dealing with somebody uh, who is uh, abusing uh, uh, opioids uh, and illicit drugs without proper treatment can cost sometimes employers up to $70,000 per incident. Uh, Vermont is, uh, again, another state that is going through some of these similar problems, and in their studies, could cost them over over a hundred thousand. So this is definitely out there, um, and it has serious financial um, consequences for not being addressed. So what can companies do to protect themselves? Um, the most important thing is education. You know, communicate risk factors for opioid abuse, and um, talk to your employees if they are using opioids about responsible use and making sure to st stick to the prescription amounts, levels, and making sure that they have conversations with their doctors about their levels of pain. Um, you want to make sure and provide support and safe return to work for your employees that are injured and make sure to communicate treat treatment options. Um, you know, there are other um, prescription drugs out there besides opioids that can help with pain. Um, and there are other treatments. Um, you know, uh, there has, has been research that doing yoga on a regular basis is actually more effective at relieving pain than um, hydrocodone. But it all depends on the person. It's very important to have those lines of communication open. Um, another important thing is just to include fentanyl in your drug screens. Um, it has basically the same detection rate as uh, other illicit drugs. Uh, the, the window is a little bit smaller, um, but it, it is a, as one of the most addictive drugs out there and one of the most potent. This is the one that poses the most danger to people. So including this in your drug panel, making sure to be clear um, in your drug and alcohol policies that you're listing the drugs that you're testing for and making sure you're including fentanyl among them. Um, and as I said, making sure that your drug and alcohol policy is updated to indicate what drugs you're testing for and to include that you will uh, scrutinize instances of prescription drug abuse as well as illicit drug abuse. Um, all of those things are critical, not only to protect your assets, but also just to protect you in general from lawsuit. Um, making sure what's, what's going to be tested uh, uh, for your new employees, because as candidates, they have a right to know. Um, and you want to make sure that they're prepared 
but also uh, making sure that if you have safe, safety sensitive positions that they know that there is a certain extra level of scrutiny for them um, and that there there uh, there will be either a zero tolerance or a less of a tolerance of them uh, using illicit or uh, abusing substances. Um, there's definitely be research that indicates that the people in safety sensitive positions that are used substance abusers are three and a half times more likely to be involved in accidents, five times more likely to hurt themselves. So you're really putting your assets at risk if you don't have those conversations and you're ending up having to pay to get uh, get uh, equipment replaced or fixed and time lost, um, as well as uh, dealing with an employee that has a, uh, has a workman's comp claim. So it's very important to make sure that those performing safety sensitive functions, it's very clear to them uh, what they're going to be scrutinized for and what the expectations are. Um, and it's also important, um, you know, to kind of know your industry. Um, some industries are worse than others. Um, accommodation services like hotels and food service, construction, mining, utilities, and healthcare professionals are among those who are the most frequent abusers, specifically of prescription drugs. Uh, make sure that you uh, train your supervisors. Um, uh, to determine if, uh, if to give them reasonable suspicion, training so that they can determine if someone is under the influence of illicit substances, how to document it, uh, making sure that they're aware of what's in the drug and alcohol policy and how that person needs to be tested and what the steps are for that. Uh, if you are in the DOT industry, this is required. Um, but for a non-DOT industry, it's important to have to just gives you an extra leg to stand on um, if, there, if this becomes a legal issue. Um, another thing that, the, and this is again more specifically for non-DOT clients, um, you know, consider adding oral testing to your policy instead. Um, urine testing generally will get people, is, is pretty substantial in this testing, but oral testing will give you a much better idea um, about uh, someone using recently um, because uh, oftentimes these drugs go into the bloodstream. Um, it, the bloodstream and saliva um, share membranes, so if it's in their blood, you will find it in their saliva. Um, it definitely takes care of some of the concerns with urine testing. Uh, there's no need to go through protocols if someone can't go, no need to guarantee that uh, uh, the collector, if they have to do an observe, it's the same gender. There's virtually no way to cheat it. Um, it can be done basically anytime, anywhere. Just put the oral swab in the mouth for about 15 seconds, take it out, send it to the lab. That's about it. Um, you know, non-invasive, and uh, it, it definitely uh, uh, has covers people's privacy. Um, you can see in the graph, just breaking down that. Um, the positive rates for oral fluid has only gotten better. Um, so it's definitely the way that people are, uh, that the Department of Transportation is heading and maybe your company should head to in their testing. Um, if you have a repeat offender, it's really important to put in your drug and alcohol policy what's going to happen to them. Um, you know, the most important thing in this epidemic that we're going through is to act with compassion. There are a there is a large amount of people that are abusing prescription opioids that aren't receiving treatment because of the fear of the stigma that they'll receive. So it's very important that 
as an employer, if you do discover that one of your employees is abusing prescription opioids, to get them the, the help they need and to basically act as a resource for them. You know, offer an employee assistance program, um, you know, uh, talk about removing them from safety sensitive functions until they can get clean, just basically be there. Um, but, you know, if you have an industry or you're in a company where you have a zero tolerance policy, make sure that that's spelled out and then make sure to remove that employee um, from the workspace. Um, that is the end of uh, my presentation. I will hand things back to Lucas, who will close us out from here. Yeah, and thank you, uh, Lucas, for going through this, because this is a very, very hot topic. And we knew it was going to be a quicker webinar today just because we wanted to get down straight to the, the dirty of how you can actually protect yourselves and your company. Um, we're going to wait just a couple of minutes. Or, uh, if you have any questions, we'll move to the Q&A time. Um, feel free to ch uh, write it down in the chat box. Uh, we don't have any questions just yet, so I'll wait for your guys' uh, uh, questions if there are any. Um, as we're waiting, I did just want to stress what Lucas uh, was stressing as well during the, the presentation, that this is a type of epidemic that is affecting, I mean, it could affect anybody. It's not, it's a cultural thing where anybody of any, you know, uh, race to demographic to age it can be affected. It, it could be someone you never thought could get affected by some kind of drug abuse. Um, someone that's worked for you for, you know, 10, 20 years and they're, they're being affected with their home life with this. And, and it's just super important that one of the things, one of the options to st stay aware of the situation is being to know what to look for. And so reasonable suspicion training, we, you know, you can check out our website, um, cleanfleet.org, about our reasonable suspicion training. But uh, it's just so important in this specific case because it could be affecting anybody. And if you don't know what signs to look for, uh, that, that could be part of the problem to catch these things early um, while in the workplace. And it did. It just comes down to what Lucas showed with the dollar signs. Um, I mean, it, it can cost a medium to large size company of like 100 employees plus tens of thousands of dollars of, of, uh, of costs associated with this potential either loss of an employee or the effect of the abuse uh, in the workplace. So just cannot stress enough how important that is. It looks like there's no other questions, so I'm just going ahead to uh, wrap this up today. I do want to mention real quick, be sure to check out our website, cleanfleet.org. There is a lot of information out there. Uh, if you're in a specific industry and you want to know what type of abuse is happening in that industry, we've got a little ebook on there. Um, drug testing stats by industry. If you're in the Northwest, uh, Oregon, Washington, Idaho area, uh, we did a dive into what is the uh, state of abuse here in the Northwest since we're based out of the, the Portland metro Oregon area. Um, so take a look at that, especially with uh, medical marijuana and recreational marijuana um, being legal here in uh, Oregon and Washington. Um, if you don't have a drug testing program yet, um, We've got information out there of why you should drug test. There's an ebook you can download. Um, if you do have a drug test program and someone's managing it, are they doing a good job? We have uh, an ebook on what you should look for for a company that's helping manage your drug testing program. Um, so use our website as a resource. You can check out other webinars, um, past ones, and some that are coming up. Uh, next month, we have one covering the DOT medical cards, questions you should be thinking about, common questions that, and common issues that happen, what exam, medical examiners are looking for um, during the uh, truck driver medical cards and physicals that happen. So uh, go ahead and you can register for that one uh, right now. So that's at uh, cleanfleet.org and you can click on webinars. Uh, with that, again, thank you, Lucas, for uh, chatting on this subject. Um, hopefully, we'll see you all next month.